Hello, Astronomy Lab students. I believe I've fixed the technical difficulty with the sound, so fingers crossed the sound should not be cutting out in and out during this video. This lab is all about one or two very simple ideas that nevertheless, nevertheless show up over and over again in astronomy, so it's worth taking a look at. You won't be doing a lot of writing. There's not much busy work. You'll just be spending some time making measurements, so I will very uncreatively refer to this as the Angles and Distance Lab, or Angle and Distance Lab. Hopefully you're aware that it's customary to chop the circle into 360 little pieces that we call degrees. I think that that system comes from the Babylonians, because it doesn't have to be 360, right? You could use a, a metric system and, and divide the circle into 100 graduations, but the advantage of a number like 360 is it has a lot of factors. You know, numbers like 60, 20, 5, etc. And it's no coincidence that the year has 365 days in it, which is close to 360. That is not a coincidence. Because ancient peoples were very interested in basic astronomy, positional astronomy. Okay, so if you're looking at the horizon and then you scan your, your view up to the point directly above your head, the zenith. We like to chop that into 90 graduations called degrees. That's the same system, right? Just for view here. Now, imagine you're on safari somewhere where they have, I don't know, wherever people go on safari, somewhere in Africa, I suppose, and you spy a faraway tiger. You're not too alarmed because it's far away. And this tree is here to remind you that you are, in fact, on safari. And if you imagine a ray leaving your eyeball and going to the top of the tiger's head and another ray going to its feet, the angle between those two rays is what I will call the angular size of the tiger as viewed by Mr. Safari Man. And I just took a guess here. Maybe that's something like 15 degrees. So I'll use this Greek letter theta, not theta with an F, theta, for the angle there. <clears throat> that's that's pretty common in math. And I'll use the letter H for the actual like lateral dimension or size of the tiger. Like if you got out a ruler or a tape measure and measured this in inches or centimeters, whatever, that's what I will refer to as H. And there's one other relevant quantity here, and that's the distance from Mr. Safari Man to the tiger. And I will use the letter R because that's so common in the physical sciences. So we've got three variables here, r, theta, and h. Now let's look at how, how um, theta changes if we change r. So we're still going to be looking at a tiger here, but we'll change the distance between the tiger and Mr. Safari Man. And before I do that, let's pick an initial distance. Uh, judging by this person's height here, I just came up with an estimate of 80 feet for the distance between Mr. Safari Man and the tiger. So what if we cut that in half? That's going to make this guy a little nervous. Let's put the, the tiger at half the initial distance. So now he's down to being 40 feet away from Mr. Safari Man. The height didn't change. What changed was R. And as a result, you can see that theta has changed. So if I go back, take a look at the angle. Is it getting bigger or smaller? Definitely bigger. When you move the object closer to the viewer, the angular size increases. And you can see up here, I've, I've taken another guess Oops, jumping ahead of myself here. If the initial angle was 15, it seems reasonable that putting the tiger half as far would make the angular size appear to double. Now this is really only approximate, but hopefully you see that it's plausible, right? This angle could be maybe double that angle or in the vicinity of double. If we do this one more time and now put the, um, the tiger not just to 20 feet, I'm not just gonna cut it in half, let's go down to one-fourth of 40 feet, all the way to 10 feet. Now this guy's getting really nervous. Yeah, when your brain registers a large angular size for something dangerous, it's time to run. Now, 10 feet, that's one-fourth of 40 feet. So the previous pattern was cut the distance in half, and the angle goes from 15 to 30. So cut the distance in, in half, the, dis, uh, the angular size goes up by a factor of two. So if I now cut the the distance by uh, down to one-fourth, 
you might expect the angle to go up by a factor of 4. Well, 30 times 4 is 120, and this angle really does not look like 120 degrees. It's not even close. So this business of um, proportionality, or I should say inverse proportionality, where having the distance causes the, the size to double, the angular size to double, it doesn't seem to work as you get down to smaller distances, or really as you get to larger angles. That's really what it's about, because if I go back here, this is a fairly small angle, and for this small angle and the next small angle, the rule seems to work. From 80 feet to 40 feet, we go from 15 degrees to 30 degrees, but now this angle is not so small, and the rule doesn't work very well. If I cut the distance from 40 down to 10, the angle does not go from 30 all the way up to 120. So I want to emphasize that the inverse proportionality of the angular size theta and the distance to the object r, that proportionality really only holds for small angles. Now, there is an exact function or formula that you could use. It's called the tangent function. We're not going to mess with that right now, but it's really not that difficult to come up with an exact relationship. This works just fine for small angles. So what does it mean for two things to be proportional? Inversely proportional, excuse me. Well, if theta depends on the reciprocal or varies as the reciprocal of distance, that means when you plot one versus the other, you get this upside down scoopy graph. So just to be clear, let's pick an initial distance. Uh, maybe this is the, the tiger when it's at 40 feet, right here. So this distance would represent 40 feet. And the angular size, if I recall, I chose an angle of 30. So the angle is up here, or that, you know, that's the, the size as viewed by the safari man. So if I now put the tiger at twice the distance, from 40 feet out to 80 feet, see how the point on the graph is now over here? So this, this distance here is double the initial distance, and you'll, no, you'll notice that the angular size has dropped from 30 down to about half of that. It, it should be exactly half of that, but this graph isn't perfect. That's the meaning of inverse proportionality. Okay, this time, instead of varying the distance of the object from Mr. Safari Man, let's actually change the size of the object we're looking at. So, very roughly, maybe this tiger is three and a half feet high when it's sitting there crouching, and it's probably taller. But I picked this number because it's, it's easy to work with. Well, if we pick something that's now twice that high, let's go with Shaquille O'Neal, seven feet tall, thereabouts. Does it seem reasonable that his angular size, as viewed by Mr. Safari Man, is double the tiger's angular size? If the, if the tiger appeared to be uh, 15 degrees across in Safari Man's field of view, then Shaq should appear to be twice the, ang the angle, or 30. Let's go with something bigger still. How about a giraffe, which is um, fully twice again as tall as Shaq. So if Shaq is 7 feet, let's go with 14 feet for the giraffe. And would you expect the same rule to work? Again, if I'm, whoops, if I'm doubling the size of the object, does the angular size also double? If I go from 7 to 14 feet, does the angular size go from 30 to 60? Well, look at this angle. Again, this is not, I'm sure this is not exactly 30, but it, it looks close enough. If I now double the height, does it really look like the angular size doubled? I don't think this is 60 degrees. I think it's shorter than 60 degrees. So again, now that we're getting to bigger angles, that, that simple proportionality doesn't seem to hold very well. It held pretty well at first. The tiger, or I should say Shaq, is double the height of the tiger. And if I go back and forth again here, you can see that the angle approximately doubles. But that starts to fall apart once I get to larger angles. So we can make a very similar statement. If you're talking about how the angular size relates to the, to the actual linear dimension in feet or inches or whatever, those two are proportional provided you're talking about small angles. And again, you could make an exact relation between those using the tangent function, which we will not do, because we're only talking about small angles here, and for small angles, this relationship works just fine. So if two things are directly proportional, as I've written here, let's consider, again, if, if this represents the height of the tiger, it has a certain angular size, as seen by Mr. Safari Man, call it 15 degrees, if we now double the height of the object, so we go from the 
Tiger to Shack. Notice that the new angular size is roughly double the initial angular size. So Shack might appear to be 30 degrees in Safari Man's field of view as opposed to the 15 degrees for the Tiger. So this straight line represents that direct proportionality. Now, as I mentioned, as you get up to larger heights and greater angles, this simple proportionality starts to break down and this curve would, would well, this line would begin to curve. So we've made two statements of proportionality here. The angular size of an object is directly proportional to its height or its lateral dimension, provided you're talking about small angles and it's inversely proportional to the distance. Again, this just means the farther away something is, like a mountain. If you drive away from a mountain, the farther away that mountain is, since r is in the denominator, the smaller it appears to be in your field of view. Greater distance translates to smaller angular size. Think about Jupiter. What would Jupiter look like if it was right in front of your face? Well, it would just be a wall of, like, you know, you could look straight up and all you would see is a wall that goes up as high as you can imagine, you could look down, you know, assuming you're at the equator of Jupiter. Jupiter's enormous. It's the same thing with the Earth, right? I mean, when you look down at the ground and then you tilt your head, it just goes as far as you can see in either direction because it's very close to you. Hopefully I'm stating the obvious here. We can combine these two statements and, and state them simultaneously as such. Theta is simultaneously proportional to the height and inversely proportional to the distance. That's the fact that we will need for this simple lab. Now you're probably aware from some of the math classes you took in high school perhaps that there are two common systems for measuring angles. We've been talking about degrees, that that's the most commonly used system, but you can also measure angles in radians. And very briefly here, in the radian system, what we normally think of as 90 degrees is considered to be pi over 2 radians. Now pi is a number close to 3, it's a little more than 3, so pi over 2 would be a little more than 1 and a half. So this angle here, you could call it 90 degrees or you could call it very approximately 1 and a half radians and all the way around the semicircle is 180 degrees or you could say it's pi, which is roughly 3 radians. We will not be using radians for this lab if you were to use radians, then you could go back to this formula and make it even easier to look at. You could replace that proportional symbol with an equal sign. So as long as you're measuring height and distance in the same units, in other words, if you're going to measure the height of the tiger in feet, you need to measure the distance in feet. As long as you've done that and you're measuring the angle in radians, not degrees, this equation is true. It works out. The numbers all agree plug in the numbers here, plug in the numbers here, that they would be the same. However, for this simple lab, we're not going to use radians, we're going to use degrees. And if you want to use degrees, you have to stick a little correction factor in there. And before I, I show you that number, let's rearrange this. I will solve it for h, so just multiply on both sides by r, and you get this equation. This is very close to what you'll be using for the lab. So you're, you will be first measuring the distance from you, or your eyeballs, to some object on a table or a countertop. You'll be estimating the angle using your fingers. We're going to use some rules where you can estimate angles with your fingers. You'll multiply those together and um, you'll be, from a distance, you'll be measuring the height of an object like a soda can. Okay, if you want to, to use this formula while measuring the angle in degrees, you need this number in front, 0 0.0174. There are more digits but because we're making approximate measurements, three digits will be fine, three sig figs. And I'm going to put a box around this to show how special it is because you will be using this repeatedly in the lab. You should probably write that formula down. It is on the paper that you can print out um, for entering your data, but you might as well write that down. Where does this number come from, you ask? Well, a moment ago I told you that 180 degrees is the same as pi radians, so let's convert one degree into radians. And all we have to do is recognize this, this ratio here is actually one. If pi radians is the same thing as 180 degrees, then this quantity is really one, which means I'm not changing a degree, I'm just converting it. So 
1 compared to 180, take that ratio of pi radians, and you get this number. Now, if you didn't follow that, all I'm saying here is 1 degree is the same as this many radians. That's why we have to multiply that by that number to fix the formula. Now, if I go back here, what happens here is if you take your angle in degrees, let's say you measured the, uh, the height of a, of a Pepsi can to look like 3 degrees. 3 degrees times this number would convert your three degrees into radians, and then you basically be using this formula. I don't have a whole lot of angular sizes measured when it comes to things in the sky, but I do know that the moon and the sun appear to be appear to be about the same size. And you all know that, right? You've all seen the sun in the sky. Maybe you're not in the habit of looking at the sun directly, but you've seen it in your periphery or you've looked at it on a very cloudy day which is still dangerous for your eye, I've, I've been told. But they look like they're about the same size. Now, hopefully you, you know, or you will know by the end of the semester, that the sun is way bigger than the moon. In fact, the sun is, what, 110 times the diameter of the Earth, and the Earth is about four times the diameter of the moon. So the sun is actually over 400 times as wide as the moon. So why do they look the same? Well, the sun's way farther away. Think about it. If they look about the same, but we know the sun's actually 400 times as wide as the moon. That means the sun must be about 400 times as far away as the moon, which gives you some sense of how large the solar system is. Anyway, they both appear to be about half a degree in your field of view. If you imagine a ray from your eyeball to the top of the sun and another ray to the bottom of the sun, the angle between those two rays would be roughly half a degree. And the constellation of Orion uh, we're in the month of September right now. We're getting into late fall. Every night you can see Orion. So take a look. And that, that's a much larger object in your field of view. Five degrees is ten times as wide as uh, the moon. And does that mean that, that this entire constellation is, is actually ten times as wide as the sun? It, it appears to be ten times as wide. But if you could go to Orion and measure this distance, is it really only 10 times as wide as the sun. Maybe you have some sense that it's way bigger than that. It's uh, several light years. I don't know how many exactly, but it's got to be at least one light year, which is way more than 10 times the diameter of the sun. So Orion is super far away. Now you should know that for many things in astronomy, a degree is not small enough uh, of an angle. There's, there's a lot of stuff in the sky that's smaller than one degree, including the sun, right? The sun and the moon, surprisingly, are less than one degree. And the stars are much smaller even than that. So we need, we need a, a unit of angular size that's convenient to work with. So what they do is, um, here's the circle with 360 degrees. You take one of these degrees, um, well, I don't want to confuse you too much, but let's see here. If, if this is zero to 10, this would have to be two, four, six, now that's, that's weird. They've chopped this up kind of strangely. But all I'm, I'm really hoping you see here is that you can take one degree, see how it's labeled one degree, and chop that up into 60 pieces. So they haven't really chopped this up into 60 little pieces because all the lines would be stuck too close together. But if you could imagine, if you can imagine dividing this 60 times, one of those tiny little wedges would be a 60th of a degree and we call that a minute of arc. Just like we chop the hour into 60 minute pieces that we call minutes, you can chop the degree into 60 minute. Minute means small. 60 minute pieces called minutes. So a degree of arc, excuse me, a minute of arc is 1 60th of one degree. And now let's, let's just confirm in Stellarium, which is a program you'll be using repeatedly this semester, let's confirm the actual angular size of the sun and the moon, as seen from Earth. That's key. It's from our vantage point here on Earth. Here we are in Stellarium. Let me get rid of this information on the screen here. Uh, the word Stellarium comes from the word planetarium, which is, you know, uh, an enclosed room. That's redundant. All rooms are enclosed. It's a room with that dome-like ceiling and they project images of the stars. And instead of calling it planetarium, I believe they called it stellarium to emphasize that you're looking uh, at the stars in addition to the planets, among other things. So I'm not gonna talk too much about stellarium at this time. 
but over here there's a, a search window. I'm going to find the moon in the sky. And, oops, it's under the ground. No, no worries, we can just get rid of the ground. I'm going to tap the letter G. And I'll zoom in on the moon here. If you hit spacebar, it centers. I'll zoom in. And you'll notice down here, it says FOV. That is field of view. Currently, it's 0.8 degrees approximately. So if I zoom in a little further, you see how I'm going to make the moon fill up the entire screen? So the, uh, the field of view here is now equal to the angular size of the moon as viewed from Earth. And you see it, it is, in fact, about 0.5 degrees. Now, since the degree has 60 minutes, half of 60 is 30. You could say that the angular size of the moon is approximately 30 minutes of arc. And you can easily look up that angular size more precisely. Maybe it's 31, 32, I don't know the exact number. And in fact, it does change because the moon is always orbiting the Earth and that orbit is not a perfect circle. It's elliptical, so sometimes the moon is a little farther from the Earth and sometimes it's a little closer. So let me turn off the atmosphere. I'm going to speed up time here and see if we can observe. Yeah, this uh, wobbly motion, this is called libration. It's a fancy word from a branch of physics that we call mechanics. But you can see how the, the angular size appears to be pulsing. It gets a little larger and then a little smaller repeatedly. That's because the moving is mo moving, the, excuse me, the moon is moving towards the Earth and away uh, in a cyclic fashion. What about the sun? Let's see what the angular size of the sun is. All right. Okay, I'm adjusting the field of view here. I will make the sun fill up the screen. And sure enough, the field of view is again 0.5. Well, now it's 0.54. What was it before? I forget. Maybe the sun's a little bigger. All right, so if you're curious, just Google the angular size of the sun in minutes of arc. It's 30-something is my guess. Can we confirm the angular size of the constellation of Orion? Let's see if that website or that graphic from the web is legitimate. What are we looking at here? Okay, there's the constellation of Orion. Yay. Okay. We'll just keep the ground out of the way. And I, I will approximately fill up the screen with Orion. 23 degrees. Maybe that graphic was focused in. I think it was focused in on these stars. Yes, I'll fill up the screen with the, the so-called belt stars and then the Orion Nebula below. Okay, now it says seven. Eh, close enough. And what about an individual star, not our planet, because stars are so far away. Let's go with a planet. What's the angular size of something like Mars? We know it's going to be smaller. Let me zoom in all the way until Mars fills up the screen. Wow, that's, that's way out there. Look how small the angular size is. Very inconvenient, right, to tell somebody, hey, uh, Mars appears to be about 0 0.00448 degrees. We don't like dealing with small decimals like that. So if you were to convert that into minutes of arc by multiplying by 60, it would be a better number. You could do even, but notice see, if you multiply 0 0.004 by 60, you still have a number less than one. So you could multiply by 60 again, and then you're talking about seconds of arc. A second of arc is a 60th of a minute of arc, which is a 60th of, of a degree. So very often astronomers use seconds of arc to talk about the angular size of something very far away, like a planet, or definitely a star. Or the distance between two stars would be more common. Okay, that was fun. Moving on. Astronomers are not the only one who deal often with angular size. Surveyors, snipers, marksmen, anybody who uses a rifle, uh, perhaps would be looking through a scope that has a, a reticle, I think it's called, superimposed over the field of view. That would help the marksman or sniper estimate angular distances. Now, I don't really know exactly what I'm looking at here, but I know it has something to do with angular size. Here's a graphic. Take a guess what MOA stands for. You guessed it, minutes of arc, I believe. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. And 
I guess what they're telling you here is, uh, I won't dwell on this because this is not something we need for the lab, but this seven apostrophe, I think that means seven um, seconds of arc, you know, I don't know, I'd have to research this, but at least we know that this graphic uh, helps a person convert between distance, angular size, and actual size. Uh, I believe one of these apostrophes means inches and the other one would mean seconds of arc. So why might a marksman, for instance, need to understand the relationship between angular size, distance, and lateral dimension? Well, presumably a, a trained marksman would, would have some idea of the actual size in feet or meters of an enemy tank, right? Maybe you know that a tank is 15 feet. And so if you could estimate its angular size using the reticle on your scope or even using these rules we're going to look at with your fingers, you could then get a rough estimate for the distance to the tank. And you might need that when it comes time to aim. If you're going to shoot something, you would need to know how far it is. So you can account for the fact that the bullet will drop or a wind, air drag, stuff like that. So there's a very simple relation between these three quantities which we've been looking at. This is the distance from the viewer to the object. This is the actual size of the object, the linear dimension in meters, feet, etc. And this is the angular size. Okay, so the, the rule that you will be using, or the technique, is just to estimate angular size by using some rules with your fingers. So this woman is not flashing gang signs here. She's not saying hang loose or peace out, whatever that is. She's estimating the angular size of something. And the, the rays that I were talking there that I was talking about you can see them right here this actually looks like a piece of, of a, like an actual physical rod I don't know what this is I pulled it off the web but here are the rules and if you want to pull this graphic up yourself just type in pinky rule astronomy or finger rule angular estimate okay we've got this one if and this is key here in order for these to be relatively accurate you must hold your hand at arm's length so you can't just stick your hand in front of your face and do this, it doesn't work. Hold your hand all the way out. And the width of your pinky is about one degree. And it's remarkably, I don't, I don't want to say uh, remarkably accurate because I tested this method tonight, the lab that you're gonna do, and it was okay. It's a little better than I expected, but not great. Three fingers are about five degrees. Um, the submit to my Marxist demands symbol here is about 10 degrees. What's this? Heavy metal and then hang loose. Or is it hang 10? A surfer? I don't know. So the numbers are easy to memorize, right? 1, 5, 10, 15, 25. They're all multiples of 5 except for the first one. And I think you should have an easy enough time just memorizing them because of that. Now, you may be wondering, wait a minute, everybody's fingers are different sizes. Some people have broad fingers. For instance, um, I, had a, I took piano lessons in high school and my piano teacher had students at a local university who were also football players but they, you know they were satisfying like a GE requirement so these football players these linebackers were taking a piano class and my teacher told me that they would get their fingers stuck between the black keys of the piano which would never happen to me but they were getting their fingers stuck because their, their fingers were like sausages compared to mine so yeah maybe you're thinking because uh, easily imagine somebody with very small hands isn't it feasible that the the diameter of their finger is like half the diameter of somebody with large hands, and that's true. But if your fingers are that big, they're probably attached to a longer arm, and so your finger would be farther from your face. So it all kind of tends to work out. If you have larger fingers or broader fingers, you probably have a longer arm as well, which would make this appear to be smaller than you might otherwise think. So again, it's very approximate. This is not like using a sextant, which is a more precise instrument for estimating angular distances. But please refer to this graphic as needed. For this lab, you will be measuring the height of two different objects indirectly. For the first object, which I'll call the nearby object, you can pick something as simple as this, a soda can at the end of a table. You will need a ruler. Now, it's possible to print out a ruler for free but I don't recommend this because um, just this was the first one I found on the web. It's supposed to be 11 inches long because remember, 
a normal sheet of paper is eight and a half by 11, not eight and a half by 12 inches. And I checked and it's not actually 11 inches long. So do this at your own risk. You can go to the grocery store even and pick one of these up for a couple bucks. Uh, remember, you didn't have to buy a lab manual and this is probably the only time I'll, I'll ask you to pick up um, supplies if you don't have them already. Almost all of the labs are computer-based using free, free software. So remember, you will, you will be um, holding your arm out, or I, I should say holding your hand out at arm's length and using the pinky rule. Let's see here, can I put this near the, the soda? If you've got both arms out, you can kind of stack your pinkies on top of each other until you've counted the number of pinkies it takes to get the height of the soda can. Maybe three fingers works. Remember, that's about five degrees. Or maybe you're close enough that it takes an entire fist. Um, but you will be doing this five different times. Two objects, and for each object, you have to do five different trials. Now, if you were to start from here, looking at the soda can, you're too close because the angle would be too big. Like if you're looking at something and you have to use this, I think this was the 25 degree angle, that's too big. Make sure you're far enough away that the object you're looking at is only about this high or this high at most, even 15 degrees, which is uh, this one, that's pushing it. Stick with smaller angles because your results will come out better. So now I've got, I've got the camera closer to the object that I'm looking at. Remember, you have to do this at five different distances. And in each instance, you need to know the distance from where your eyeball is to, let's say, the center of the object. It's really best if you have a tape measure like this. It doesn't have to be a steel tape measure like the one I have here. You could use even a string tape measure. If you don't have a tape measure, it's a bit tedious, but you will have to stack this up a bunch of times. So maybe you could take a piece of tape and mark the, uh, the point on the table at which you'll be standing when you make your measurement, and then you know, line the left end of the ruler up with the tape, and you can use your finger to indicate where the right end is, then you scoot it, count off one foot, count off another foot, I think you get the idea. I think you should use inches for this lab, so if you have a ruler, go ahead and use inches. Try to measure to the nearest half inch, maybe even quarter inch. See, inches are a little more cumbersome to work with than centimeters. A centimeter is divided into 10 millimeters. That makes it easy to make judgments of distance within the centimeter, but the inch is chopped into, what, sixteenths? So just try to measure to the nearest half inch, let's say. And make that measurement as accurately as possible. At the end of all five trials, you can take the, uh, the ruler and make a measurement of the height this way. This will obviously be your most accurate measurement of the height of your object. We'll call this the true value. So for the soda can, it looks like it's about five inches tall. You should make a more precise measurement than that. We can call that the true value, the one that you, that you measure in this manner. And all your other um, measurements will be done using the formula. See how that works? It's an indirect measurement because you're going to measure the distance to the object and the angular size. And from those two numbers, you can calculate the height. And this is what's done all the time in astronomy, because think about it. Um, although we have sent space probes to a variety of planets within the solar system, we haven't actually been to objects outside the solar system. So if you have some way of, of estimating the distance to the object, all you have to do is multiply the distance to the object by its angular size, and you can determine the actual lateral dimensions in meet, kilom or meters or kilometers, whatever unit that you're using. Okay, is there anything else I can say about that? You know, you are welcome to use centimeters if you want, but you would need to indicate that on your, uh, your handout. I would just stick with inches. So five trials for two different objects. Here I'm just talking about a nearby object, and truthfully, the setup that I'm showing you here, I'm probably a little too close for that formula to be accurate. Remember, it works better for small angles. So you want to be several feet away, um, more than several. I mean, right now I'm probably six feet from this soda can. When it comes time for your, your second object, you want to choose something that's significantly taller. For instance, that music stand or even the door itself. 
that's quite a bit taller than something like a soda can. And that means that you'll have to be standing much farther away so that the angle is still small. So pick one object as your second object and stick with it. I do recommend uh, something like a door. The problem with the door is you need to be able to stand a good, I don't know, 15, 20 feet away from the door so that the angle is small. And that may not be possible in your residence. So you might have to go to a store or uh, some other building where you can stand at a good distance from the door. You also need to be able to measure directly the height of the door. If you've only got the ruler, you'll have to stack the ruler up from bottom to top. Hopefully you've got a tape measure and you can do it that way. You will also have to use the tape measure to measure the distance from where you're standing to the, uh, to the object that you're measuring. So because you may be standing 20 feet away to get that small angle, you may have to put your, your tape measure all the way out and then set it up again. What you could do is actually just measure off your steps. You could just walk from where you're going to stand to where the object is, count those steps, and then try to convert that into feet. I may talk about that more in another video. Obviously, that would be pretty approximate, but that would allow you to, to take measurements from farther away. If we did this in class, we would have something called a hodometer or a surveyor's wheel. It's like a, it's like a measuring tape that's wrapped around a wheel, and you can just walk it over to the thing that you're measuring and measure distance that way. But we don't have that luxury because this is distance learning. So you'll have to get creative. Now, if this was your actual setup, maybe this is you holding your hand out at arm's length. You'll notice that, let's see here, my fist is approximately equal to the height of the, the music stand there. And I could call that, I believe it was 10 degrees, or maybe it's 10 degrees and an extra pinky, which would be more like 11 degrees. So you can review the rules and make your best estimate. But again, you're gonna to have to do this from five different distances and make sure that each distance is, is sufficiently great that the angle is small. If, if you find yourself doing this, that's 25 degrees, that's too large of an angle and your, your results won't come out very well. The formula that we're using is only, is only correct really for small angles. Well, what else can I say about that? Uh, yeah, I know this is a little tedious, but like I said, there's not much else to the lab. This, this will comprise most of the lab, so your time will be spent making the measurements, and then we'll do a little bit of number crunching, but that will be it for this week's lab.